All right, cool. Welcome to the sharding implementers call number zero. Um, this is quite the turnout. Hey, Justin. Hi there. Uh, excited to see all these people that are working on sharding. Um, so just a few procedural things. I, are, the plan is to do these every other week on the weeks that we don't have the core dev calls. Sometimes the core dev calls get pushed back a week. I have to push this call back a week so we don't have two big calls in one week. Um, I figured we have a lot of us, but if you can just go briefly, you know, one by one, uh, say your name, what team you're working with, and that's that, that'll probably be fine. You can say like where in the world you are. Um, and then we'll move on to begin talking about like actually the different teams and what, what's going on right now with the teams. Um, all right, I'll start. I'm Danny, I'm with the Ethereum research team um, and I'm in New Orleans. I'm Justin, also from the research team at the foundation and I'm based in Cambridge, UK. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Raul. I'm with uh, I'm with Prismatic Labs, and I'm based in Chicago. Hi, I'm Nikolai Wolf from Piety Technologies. I'm based in Moscow. We're currently looking forward to implementing some sharding soon. My name is Mikhail. I'm from Harmony team, um, based in uh, Russia, in Omsk, in Siberia. I'm Dmitry, I'm from Harmony team and the Terrium J2 uh, in Russia and from Russia, St. Petersburg. Hi, I'm Ben Edgington from um, Consensus Pegasus uh, Group, um, working on the Pantheon client. Uh, I'm usually based uh, in the UK, but today in Switzerland. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome Olivier Begesser to uh, the, the call, he joined our team yesterday. Hi there, I'm Olivier. I, as Ben said, I joined yesterday. I'm based in Paris and I work with uh, Nicolas Liochon who's um, on vacation. Uh, I'm with Pegasus. Hey, uh, Preston here uh, from Prismatic Labs and I'm based in New York City. Hello, I'm Yannick. I'm uh, working for BrainBot, but helping at the Python sharding implementation. And I'm from Munich, where it's very hot right now. Hello, uh, Shaowen uh, from Eastern Foundation Research Team, um, based in Taipei. Uh, Vitalik will come in three minutes, by the way. Yeah. Hello, Hello, I'm... Uh, uh, sorry, I'm uh, Mami from uh, Status and uh, I'm based in Paris. Hello, I'm Ryan, also from Status and uh, I'm based in the UK. Hi, I'm Jared, also from Status, working on Nimbus. Uh, I'm everywhere. And I'm Jacek, also from Status, um, right now in Costa Rica. Hi. I'm Chris, um, I'm doing research on developer practices in scaling across layer one and layer two solutions. Um, and that research is funded by the uh, Ethereum Grants uh, Foundation May, May Grants cohort. Uh, so I'm just listening in today and, and taking notes. I'm a Paul from uh, Sigma Prime, We're working on Lighthouse and I'm out of Sydney. Uh, my name's Adrian. I'm working with Paul for Sigma Prime in Australia as well. I'm Carl, uh, currently in South Africa, um, either working on um, uh, decentralized staking pools or at the moment trying to throw together a uh, uh, Viper BLS uh, implementations, some, some stuff. Uh, I'm Chishan. Uh, I'm working on P2P with Kevin um, in a uh, research team in Taipei. 
Hey guys, this is Lane Reddig. Uh, I'm on the eWASM team and I'm in New York City where it's also really hot and humid right now. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Kevin and I'm from Ethereum Research Team and I'm based in Taiwan. I'm Nicholas, I'm also part of the Ethereum Research Team. Um, I'm also from Taiwan. Hello. David out. Hi. Hi. We're going around just giving a brief intro of who we are and where we are and what team we work with. Um, okay. Where are you? Uh, what was that? Where are you? Oh, where am I? I am in Toronto right now. Cool. Cool. Here is everyone. Um, anyone else? Um, I'm Makira. I'm from Chain Safe Systems. I'm currently based in Toronto right now. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm Casey. I'm with the Ethereum JS. So I'm based in the U.S. Uh, state of Michigan, but currently in Florida. And surprise, we went threw in an apparently random order without many collisions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty solid. Yeah, we may, have found I, a new, we may have found a new consensus mechanism here. This is exciting. Yeah, just, just go when you feel like it. Make a block. So um, I guess I'm the last one. Oh, cool. Um, Alex from eWASM and Solidity, um, based in Ireland. Great. Um, okay, so I know there are various clients, various kind of proto implementations working on sharding or planning on working on sharding. Um, if one member from each team um, can go through and give a brief update on what's going on in their world related to that, um, Ewasm could potentially give an update to, uh, well, we can, we'll save that for, I guess, research updates. Um, but if you're planning on working on a client, working on a client, uh, working on a beacon chain implementation, something like that, someone from your team, give us an update. Um, I can call out teams. I don't remember all of them probably off the top of my head, uh, but how about someone just go? Or I can pick a team. Paul, give us an update on Lighthouse. <laughs> uh, good choice. Uh, so yeah, it, it's coming underway. We're just waiting for the spec to finalize. We got we got the first round of spec kind of implemented and the transitions in, but um, it's changed. So now we're um, we're kind of uh, in the next maybe week or so. We're going to get onto that. Um, we're playing around with P2P, just trying to get like some P2P instance running and some interface with it, so we can swap it out later. Uh, and trying to play around to try and find some um, BLS aggregate implementations that work. And that are somewhat safe, at least at least a tiny bit safe. <laughs> Great. Um, I'll give an update on the kind of the Python beacon chain repo that EF people have been working on. Um, I'm almost done with the v21 uh, update. Um, I have a PR there with some like proof that it kind of works testing um, and I'm going to enhance that today. Hopefully I'll have like a decent reference of the V2 one uh, by the end of the week. Uh, does anybody on or yeah. Okay. Who, how about Nimbus? Okay. So um, I started uh, implementing the beacon chain V2.1 uh, two weeks ago. Uh, the thing is uh, at that point, the reference implementation in Python was, um, disconnected from uh, what was in the um, uh, hack MD stuff. So I started uh, basically from scratch and trying to get uh, as far as possible. Um, and also I explored um, what we could use for uh, BLS uh, cryptography and uh, started a wrapper in uh, NIM uh, for uh, Milagro Crypto, though, um, I have some uh, reservation about uh, 
uh, I think we need to build something from scratch uh, regarding crypto to have something proper. Great, thanks. And Prismatic Labs, who's renamed their client Prism, I believe. Yeah, guys, uh, lots of updates. So we, you know, I don't know if all of you are aware, but we migrated away from Geth. Um, given the spec, we realized that it's best to just really have, uh, you know, an independent Ethereum 2.0 implementation. Um, so here's some of the stuff that we've done. Uh, we have local network P2P via MDNS uh, through Gossip Sub. We fully transitioned into our own independent project. Um, we have a full beacon node running and a sharding client that runs as a separate process. They communicate with each other via gRPC. Um, we finished the uh, incoming block sync processing conditions. We have uh, crystallized and active state transitions, um, shuffling of attesters and proposers, obtaining the cutoffs, and announcement of blocks via P2P. Um, we have the validator registration contract uh, that is, you know, the through a deployment tool that we created, uh, we are able to read the logs and register and induct validators into the queue. And then we also uh, we're currently working on the fork choice rule and kind of um, doing in, uh, initial chain sync. Aside from that, we created a simple like kind of simulator tool that allows us to like basically simulate incoming blocks. And we're going to be using that to basically uh, try out and test our system um, from an end-to-end -end basis going forward. We've been exploring a lot of different things and we have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of ideas around kind of P2P communication. That's something that my partner Preston here will be able to talk about later. Uh, but overall, we have a lot more to cover, but that's just kind of some of the things that we've done recently. Nice. And is that um, the state transition, the V21 or the previous version? I believe, I believe it's V21. Oh, cool. Great. I am I'm excited to take a look at that. Um, Cool. Who? Oh, uh, Pegasus. Have y'all done any work or any update? Yeah, I can give an update. So uh, mostly focused on uh, team building uh, lately. So Olivier's joined. We've got uh, a developer joining in, in a few weeks' time. Um, the immediate targets to work on are, are the BLS implementation. Seems common theme. Um, we we're looking at random. The random number generation, uh, we think there's quite a lot of work to be done there, um, and also on the beacon chain implementation. Great, thanks. And how about Harmony? Uh, we have started to work on the beacon chain implementation about uh, three weeks ago. Uh, what we have uh, by now is a validator registration contract. Uh, and uh, it's possible to deposit your own validator and uh, query for deposited validators from transaction receipts. And now we we have already made plans on uh, next step is block production on the beacon chain and the block processing part also. So yeah, we're starting to implement like uh, state transition functions, block production and so on. So, yeah, that's it for now. Uh, by the way, we, uh, we have created a page that, uh, that uh, contains all the progress and, uh, and closed plans about our implementation. And it's, it will be possible to get uh, some pull requests there to see a reference to implementation. I guess it might be useful for other implementers. I'll share the link uh, after this meeting. Yeah, if anyone, any links we talk about, if you can pop them into the Gitter sharding channel, um, I'll aggregate the stuff after the call. Um, at Chainsafe, we've been working on the Lodestar chain, which is our JavaScript implementation of the Beacon chain. Um, right now, we've been looking at options to implement BLS um, signatures. Uh, right now, I've been um, playing with the Milagro crypto libraries available in JS and trying to use the primitives to build um, a BN128 curve to match with the current Python specs. Um, we're also exploring the option of possibly compiling from Rust to WebAssembly um, for that. And um, afterwards, we'll be implementing the state transition functions um, as per the v2.1 um, spec. Um, and that's pretty much what we've been doing. We started this project as an internal, uh, at an internal hackathon we held three weeks ago. Um, so progress has been steady. 
um, that's an update from our team. Great, thanks. Um, is there any client I missed? Okay. Um, any research updates? Um, I know there's been various things posted to ETH research um, that, and I know there's some different things going on with some some of the EF people. Is there any update anybody wants to give right now? Um, I, from uh, my side, have been uh, working on these uh, uh, on the re the uh, recursive rocks justification for choice rules. And I uh, yeah, wrote out that post on ETH Research a couple of days ago that tries to make a kind of minimal partial spec of the uh, mech validators, the uh, beacon chain with the, for with the fortress uh, rule and justification finalization and validator set changes. But it like minimal in the sense that it tries to kind of focus as much as, po as possible on just that and doesn't really focus on like implementation, BLS signatures, aggregation, shard committees, or any of those other details. And the goal of this is basically to just have that be in one place so that it can be uh, it can be uh, researched, analyzed for security, uh, like hopefully formally proven, and so forth. Um, so can you give us a, a brief on what your design goal is with the RPJ? Uh, sure. So uh, the design goal, uh, there's a few design goals, right? So one of them is to maintain the uh, basic properties of like safety and liveness as defined in the Casper FFG spec. Um, another is to make the algorithm uh, or be as kind of uh, as uh, simple as possible. So one way in which Casper FFG did not uh, satisfy that is that it um, had this uh, weird mecha uh, mechanism where in order to choose in between between different checkpoints, you have one mechanism, but then in order to choose which chain is the longest uh, with it, uh, from one within one particular epoch, you use some particular some different rule, and so that basically doubles the complexity of the thing. And um, also, it another design goal is what I call stability, which basically means uh, the fork choice is a good prediction of the future fork choice. And in general, like hybrid fork choice rules are very hard to make stable because uh, it, it's hard to make sure that the, uh, what the whatever fork choice rule you're using on the small scale actually is predictive of the fork choice rule you're going to use on the large scale. Um, whereas, so recursive proximity to justification basically gets rid of epochs and it, it uses the same kind of proximity to justification mechanism to just choose between blocks in general. And it basically allows any block to be a checkpoint. The um, let's see, um, another go reason why I started going in this direction is that I cared about uh, maximizing resistance to uh, manipulation of the uh, random uh, of the random numbers. So basically, the idea is that even if the uh, random beacon is total crap, so for example, even if the attacker can basically choose the seed from like 1 billion possibilities, then the mechanism should still be secure and it should still even be secure enough that the chain uh, basically never reverts even one, si uh, even one single block, and, um, assuming like low network latency and so forth. And, the re and there's, there's two reasons for this. One of them is that um, instead of the random the, the random sampling being stateless, the random sampling chooses permutations and goes through permutations. So the total number of slots given to each validator is in the long run going to be the same. So you can't manipulate that upward. And the other property is that because it uses ghost instead of a longest chain as a fortress rule, it basically means that the proposers, which were these kind of attackable choke points of chain lengthening before, don't really have that much influence anymore. And so the chain is basically resistant against even like some up to like 80 to 90 percent of proposers that are um, uh, being uh, taken over by the attacker as long as the majority of the attesters is honest. Great. Um, any more updates from you, Vitalik, or anyone else on the research team or at large? 
I'll have updates on the ninety nine percent fault tolerance stuff that I yeah, linked in the er in the Casper Telegram soon. I'm just having a. Uh, Waiting for a uh, goon to give me some uh, review of uh, review and comments, and I'll publish it. And in parallel, I'll think about that more. But that's probably for later. Cool. So, um, oh, sorry. Uh, otherwise, uh, since uh, well, uh, at Stellus, we're like pretty new to all the sharding stuff. Uh, I've been connecting a lot of uh, uh, blog posts, research notes, uh, forum posts, uh, videos about uh, sharding and everything else for Ethereum 2.0. I post the link in the chat. Uh, basically, it's a, a repo and. Uh, if you think something is missing or you want to add uh, material, uh, feel free to put a pull request. So uh, currently there is stuff about sharding, Casper, uh, Plasma, state channels, uh, BLS, Gossip Sub, uh, uh, with a video from ECDC, blog posts and stuff like this. Awesome, thank you. Um, so in terms of uh, research updates from uh, my side, I've been focusing on the randomness beacon. Um, basically how to instantiate it once we have a VDF um, and the, the various security considerations, but uh, also in particular, which uh, specific VDF construction um, we'd like to use. So I've gone through the whole literature and uh, I think my favorite construction right now is by uh, Benjamin uh, Wisselowski, um, which has a, an, an actual proper VDF in the sense that there's a, an exponential gap between the, the time it takes to compute the function and the time it takes to, to verify it. One of the, um, the key questions that uh, we're looking at is, because it's based on, on, on RSA groups, or at least that's one way to instantiate it, um, we need to think about uh, trusted setup. Uh, well, well, how do we pick the, the RSA modulus, basically? And one very promising approach is basically to pick um, relatively small uh, random numbers and use those uh, random numbers as the, the moduli for parallel VDFs. So the VDF would be kind of composed of sub VDFs, each with its own modu um, modulus. And if at least one of the modulus is, is safe in the sense that it cannot be factored, then the whole construction is, is safe. Um, so, you know, it's quite multidisciplinary because um, I'm, I'm talking to the cryptographers and actually we've, uh, the foundation is organizing an event where we're inviting the, the top, the world's top VDF cryptographers to all meet, uh, in San Francisco in the, in a couple of weeks and almost everyone is attending. So there should be some good stuff from that event. Um, but we're, I'm also talking to, to number theorists and, also a very important consideration is the, the hardware manufacturing. So the, the current plan is basically to build a VDF uh, ASIC, which is a commodity, so which um, is, is basically freely accessible um, um, and, and is given to a lot of people. And the, this ASIC needs to be close to what a, a, a no expense spared attacker can, can build uh, himself. So the performance of the VDF in terms of, of speed needs to be very fast. And that's to basically counter uh, a couple of attacks that uh, an attacker with a much faster ASIC uh, can do. So I'm kind of um, talking to a lot of people and tying everything together. And I'm hoping that uh, I'll have like a more visibility um, towards a, a full spec in maybe a month and a half or two. Uh, in about one month, there will be um, hopefully a, a report from hardware specialists that is going to um, give us visibility on whether or not um, manufacturing a VDF ASIC, which is 
is, is fast enough, is, is doable. So how much will it cost? Uh, how much time will it take? Uh, and considerations like that. Uh, Justin, you mentioned the research library. Uh, do you have a, like a curated list of reading material to get into this problem space? Yes, uh, I do. So I'm, I'm actually preparing one for the event in a couple of weeks and I'll, I'll tweet about it and I'll make sure that, uh, that you can find it. Fantastic, thanks. Great, uh, anything, any other research updates? Um, anything from the EWASM team that might be relevant or some thoughts on sharding as you've kind of been digesting East 2.0? Um, I do have some thoughts about, mainly we've been, we've been focused on uh, thinking about cross shard um, transactions. So give that for the agenda item about cross shard transactions. Uh, if you're inspired to talk about it right now, I think we can move towards that. Okay. Um, so the program we're planning and building is a little bit unorthodox for most because we start, or at least I say we, but maybe I don't want to speak for the whole EWASM team, but at least myself, um, want to want to focus on phase, the phase two uh, part of, of the sharding spec. Um, the question is, how can you implement, how can you prototype phase two before, uh, without a phase one uh, implementation already uh, built? And the answer is, well, phase one and phase two are, are actually decoupled, like Justin and, and others um, are saying, then the only thing that phase one produces is a bunch of ordered data blobs. Um, so these are shard blocks and with cross links between them. So if you just black box phase one kind of what would be say a, um, a JSON, a big, a big a JSON file that defines um, some data blobs in an order uh, in a given order and then the phase two prototype would just process these data blobs and uh, and achieve cross shard transactions. Um, and so that's our hope with uh, with <coughs> prototyping phase two. Well, one of the advantages of doing this in JavaScript, a couple of advantages over um, other languages that are working on research prototypes like like Python is uh, JavaScript. There's already a, um, a P library implemented in JavaScript. And also JavaScript already has access to a native uh, engine. So I have to mess with any, you know, FF5, um, workarounds to, to get access to either libp2p or to a WASM JIT engine. Um, so yeah, those are the two benefits of prototyping phase two in JavaScript, and uh, that's about it. Great, and so you are a little bit more about what you're trying to prototype. You're trying to prototype um, access, execution, like a probabilistic execution engine across, but to be able to resolve cross shard communication before the cross links are necessarily processed or what exactly? Sorry, I'm missing something. No, well, I mean. <clears throat> are, are you, you, you're doing the cross shard uh, execution, like through the, through the cross links? Sure, well, so I mainly think about it from a delayed state execution <laughs> um, model versus the non-delayed. Um, so the cross links would already be there. And uh, at that point, you know, the phase two, phase two is completely decoupled from phase one. So the, the cross links are, are put in at phase one, right? Not phase right, two. Right. So we don't have to worry about 
phase one, we can just black box all the details of BLS signatures, of you know, putting in cross links, of forming shard blocks. We just accept as you know a given. Here's a bunch of ordered blobs with cross links. Now, how do you process the transactions? Um, so this is kind of the approach I'm, I'm hoping to to take, and uh, and be completely ignorant of all phase one details. <laughs> Great. Um, while we're on while we're on the cross shard communication, um, I know there's the. The different what, opaque sharding, transparent sharding. I can't remember which is which, but uh, the idea of um, the users having to deal with this or not. I know that in general, right now, the thought is to push it out to um, the application layer to handle dealing with the cross shard stuff. Is there any? I know, but this is kind of a contentious debate while we were in Berlin. Um, are there any more thoughts or update on research on cross shard communication, or is that maybe a little further down the line at this point? Okay, we'll pick it up again another time. Um, great. So the next thing I threw on just recently is the the V two one spec. Um, are there any questions about this at this time? I know. I mean, if it's um, as you're working on it, if you begin working on it, um, we can answer questions in the in the channel. But yeah, there, there, yeah go on, Vitalik. I was just going to give the a, a bit of a warning about that that. Some parts of that, well, it's parts of that spec are kind of explicitly provisional in the sense that, like things about how the dynasty change works, how the uh, epoch transitions work, and so forth, are going to change pretty significantly with if the recursive uh, proximity to justification stuff gets included. The main reason why I haven't in, uh, put those things into the spec yet is because. I feel like I don't want to waste uh, people t too much of people's time with like constantly redesigning and you know, like implementing this in code ten times in parallel. Then the spec changes and implements it more in parallel, and would prefer to wait a bit more for um, the yeah, new fortress rule stuff to solidify more. Ideally, again, like get more review from different sources before we try to like actually put serious code into it. Like the so parts of that's uh huh. Oh, okay. so given the current spec, is there anything that yeah, maybe should be Yeah, so I was and... um, okay, so I was about to kind of go into that. So, like, the things that absolute, I think are absolutely worth working on, and, and number one is, is um, obviously aggregate signatures. Um, number two is the general structure that you have this active state, you have a crystallized state. Um, aggregate signatures can be included. There is a bit, there is a bit field that keeps track of all these aggregate signatures. There's um, probably for now maybe black box dynasty changes, so I don't have, don't really have dynasties change and just have a uh, one single validator set. And like I feel like at this point, if you can get even you know like half the spec, like even a minimal version of the beacon chain that doesn't implement any of the dynasty stuff, doesn't implement any of the Randall stuff. And then if you get to that point, then probably just focus on the peer-to-peer -peer and try to see if you can make it actually work, actually working as a network. And the rest of the kind of like protocol structure and details will probably keep getting filled in over the next two months or so. Cool. Um, any other thoughts, questions on the V21? as it currently is. Um, just in general, the, the, one of the big things that happened with V21 was um, combining the block, the beacon chain block attestations um, and the uh, shard crosslinks. And so they, they are one and the same mm -hmm. and also serve as the FFG votes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, so in this spec, well, there is actually three things that, that are combined together. One of them is FFG voting. One of them is like small-scale block attestation. Um, and those things are like fully combined now with, with RPJ. <gasps> and the third thing is uh, the uh, shard uh, cross-link votes. 
the uh, mech the mechanism for like which sh- like what shards are active at any during any particular dynasty and who and who is assigned to what cross like that that that, that itself might end up going going through a couple more redesigns. Um, so actually, if you're implementing, maybe for now, like I would even say consider just making it a stub where. Well, or the simplest stub is probably to just say one height corresponds to one particular shard, and then if the shard committees end up being really tiny, well, so be it. Got it. Uh, yeah. Um, one thing I'd probably add is that the uh, with the way RPGA works, um, in the specific case where the number of validators is extremely small, it does open up some other possibilities. So some of the other possibilities would basically be that if the valid if the number of validators is too small to support uh, one distinct committee at every height, then we'll basically just have the validator sets overlap and for, and keep one committee at at, at every height, but force the uh, committees to like be or some validators to be part of multiple committees. Like those are the kinds of ideas that I want to kind of keep thinking about. Mm. Okay, um, so B21, there's some good stuff there. The bones, I think, are generally in place, but as discussed, there's gonna be some, still some changes. Um, the next thing is the P2P, conforming to P2P messages, prismatic protocol buffers, and other P2P-related discussion. Um, does anybody wanna start us off on P2P stuff? Yeah, I can start on that. So I, I put this on the agenda, um, basically, uh, at at Prismatic Labs, what we're doing is we're using um, protocol buffers uh, for now because they are easy to use. They, you know, they generate the stubs that we need for these clients to talk to each other really easily. But the problem is that they have unordered fields, which are unordered. So that's difficult for for hashing if you're considering like sending a block across with ordered transactions, and it's not going to be may not come out on the same order for another client. So we're, you know, exploring other alternatives like flat buffers, which you just read the wire protocol. Like there's no like re-serializing that. So we're kind of looking at that. But what I wanted to bring up is, can we um, start early on agreeing on some kind of schema, uh, preferably something that's somewhat well supported and can generate some kind of code for for most of the languages we want to use. Uh, so I just wanted to hear if anybody had any thoughts on you know preferences or or anything like that on conforming to messages early, so that when we want to test it out, we can already start communicating. Uh, do you have any prototype for messaging? Like maybe you have some somewhere in the, on some public page. Or yeah, so in our um, Prism repository, we have our, our proto messages defined. And this is what our clients are using to talk to each other uh, at the moment. So if you want to look and kind of see how we're using, like how the scheme is defined and like how that's used, to, it's in our repository. Yeah, I think that would be a good point for every one of us to start from like a discussion of, you know, schema of and message format. I think in, what what it was before is we sort of just agreed on the fields and sort of what order they were in, and that was just kind of like written down, and then we all implemented that. I'm kind of hoping for Ethereum 2, we have something a little bit like smarter and easier to use. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, hello. Um, I've take a, took a look about the, um, the portal, of stuff and uh, I'm not sure if I'm right. Is that the 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 term ministric, uh serialization only when we use uh, when we are using the data structure map and that's that's when this problem uh, happens about the ordering. Yeah. So the, the so map. the problem the problem is that when when one client and one language or one implementation um, serializes this into uh, regarding the ordering problem, like the the protobuf spec. If you look at the wire protocol itself, it doesn't define the order. It's based. Yeah, it's 
I mean, it's unordered by definition. Uh, These are so unordered fields. Yeah, yeah, but also the spec, the way it works is that if, if you're reading a stream of protobuf, you're supposed to look at the last value for, for every potential key. Like this is a feature of protobuf that you can uh, basically append uh, a protobuf blob on, on at the end of something, and you're supposed to get the last value back from your parser if you're a conforming protobuf parser. So th there's a lot of these little um, extras that, that make it difficult to use in a, um, in a hashing setting. What could um, possibly work is a stripped down version of Probuff where, where you just pick a few features and, and, and prohibit others, a little bit like EWASM where floats are no-no. Uh, regarding that, I think, uh, well, flat buffer from uh, Google was an evolution in that direction and also uh, Captain Proto uh, or Captain Proto, uh, which was, uh, it's not from Google, but it was from the guy who implemented uh, Protobuf at Google and left the company later. Um, I have a question. Uh, so, uh, Prosthetic Labs, you are using the protobuf for P2P. And how about um, what do you are you using f for the serialization of the uh, database? Like, how do you s store the block in what? Uh, which serialization you are using for uh, encoding? The black data. So, because, so for um, um, uh, 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 sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Um, go ahead. Um, uh, um, my question for this is: uh, if we are using different serialization of the data storage and P2P serialization, would it uh, cause that we have to do two serialization when syncing the blocks? I mean, we have we have to uh, serialize the block from database and then send to the peers who are asking a block from you. Oh, okay. Yeah, we we still use Proto for serialization and storing it inside of uh, the inside of inside of level DB. So specifically, you know, we right now we also serialize the active state and the and the and the crystallized state. Uh, with protobufs. Um, we use protobufs for basically all process communication um, and our sharding client runs as a separate process and connects to a beacon chain via gRPC. So um, yeah, we serialize everything that we talk, that, that processes talk to each other with through protos. And we currently serialize, like I said, the active state and the, and the, and the block data um, with proto.marshall and these methods, and then we store them in local storage. Wait, so um, one question, like, why does the crystallized state even need any special serialization when you could just, like, pack the values together? You mean just, like, get the, get the bytes out of that? So we just, yeah. we just, um, oh, so we, because we, we're communicating the crystallized state uh, between processes, so we, oh, right. um, we, cre we created a proto for it, that's why. Yeah, otherwise we would just, you know, just, we just need to get the bytes from it. Yeah, that one's just, okay. like, a wrapper, a container for for that okay, yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, guys, I have a question uh, for you. Um, I'm uh, interested in uh, how uh, signature aggregation stuff will look like from network point of view. Uh, I mean, uh, how many messages it will be required to send, uh, for example, to, some, to a test block? Did you do any experiments in that? We have it in the network. Now, um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, not much yet, though you can kind of do the math and see how much you'll end up having to download. Um, probably the main, well, the one kind of bottleneck that I do see, right, is that you have all of these validators that are constantly publishing all uh, this. Uh, fairly heavy load of uh, messages that then all get aggregated every eight seconds or whatever into this so one single thing. So that does seem like the sort of thing that could 
easily benefit from a separate peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, but aside from that, I feel like the best one of the, and the other number that we have is obviously all the different estimates for actually how many validators will end up, will end up participating and how many will be partic participating during each epoch. If uh, doing it the naive way of just everyone broadcasts and then proposed or aggregates is too hard, then there is a scheme for doing it hierarchically that could be, um, that could be considered, where basically you would have no, uh, nodes in the network just randomly choose to specialize in a particular slice of uh, node addresses and then aggregate for that, and then they broadcast that to the proposed, so, or rebroadcast that, and then that's what the proposers try to download. In addition to the hierarchical uh, strategy, you could also think of a kind of um, random path strategy where you you keep on um, tagging on your own signature and kind of the the gradually aggregating signature travels through the whole network. Well, that um, doesn't work because that takes a lot of enzyme. Like, we, I think like if we want to get uh, block times to be reasonably efficient, then we need something that takes uh, like two to three rounds of network communication, which basically by itself implies like a fan in of either square root of n or q root of n. Right. I guess you could have a hybrid between between the right. Okay. Thanks, guys. Uh, maybe a prismatic labs already did something like that or did some experiments in signature aggregation networking. So we're actually in that process right now. Um, we're at the moment just setting up the entire communication between the sharding client and the beacon node and getting getting a testers and kind of proposers to figure out when they have to perform the responsibilities. So that's entailing, you know, doing some just like you know fetching fetching proto data from from the beacon node and aside from that yeah we haven't really we haven't started exactly on the signature aggregation and the downloading of that so is there any consensus on the proto buff stuff or is that something we still need to talk about later um vitalik what do you think of uh, using the simple serialization in the beacon chain repo as a LOP replacement? This one. By the way, guys, what's wrong with the RLP? Any thoughts on RLP? Too so complicated. Like, yeah, so our, our proposals not necessarily like get away from RLP, but to have some like generative uh, schema that we can all sort of conform to. And if there's something faster that we can use, like RLP is not very fast, that would be great. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll concur there. Uh, I've been missing a schema for RLP. Otherwise, any schema language goes CBOR. Uh, I saw Alex proposing, and Protobuf is one, but we'd, we'd have to gut it. Uh, there's B encode from BitTorrent. They have a scheme as well, I think. Yeah, OK, I see. Schemaless is like a really good point for to move from our old to some something that you have a schema. Yep. Got it. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, you know, if, if if people want to dig into this a little bit over the next couple of weeks and we can talk about it again next time. Um, hopefully we can figure out a an encoding that works for us. Um, Should but, just open um, a, a kind of a thread on the Ethereum uh, research forum about that? Yeah, I think that'd be a good place to, to discuss it.
Also, for other teams that are implementing this and probably, you know, experimenting with protobus or flat buffers, it would be cool to try if you can try to communicate with our client uh, via RPC and see, you know, see if you can break um, break any of these encodings. Are you guys using Gossip Sub, right? Uh, yeah, right now it's all locally networked through MDNS, though. So, but we're uh, we're we're quickly going to start uh, exploring the other discovery schemes like DHTs. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I don't know if that's a topic for later, but we might want to try and pick um you know pick some some P2P network. We we don't have uh, Gossip Sub in Rust yet, so it's going to like add some overhead from our, our perspective before we can talk to you. Got it. Yeah. Is there um. I know there's been a few people on the research team that's been doing some uh, keep digging into various uh, P2P constructions uh, for sharding. Is that something you want to talk about right now? Or do, does the research that y'all been working on, does that inform the beacon chain or is that more for actually when we have the shard chain? Um, and are these two separate kind of P2P constructions? Uh, sorry, the, the beacon, the beacon chain, and what what other chain? The so the are we going to be using the same um, P2P setup for the beacon chain and also the shard chain? Um, well, there's no one shard chain. You mean all of the shard chains? The shard or, chains, yes, plural. Um, so the main difference is right that the beacon chain is for everyone, but the shard chains are only for well. I, the shard chain headers are for everyone, but the shard chains are for all the whatever subset of nodes cares about them. And it would be a, a pretty serious loss of efficiency to uh, have them all be in one peer to peer network. So the um, like we do need, I think, some kind of uh, well. And I know there's already work being done on a shorted peer to peer network, which is what it makes sense to put the shard chains onto, and then. The beacon chain, like at least I think, should be on some kind of layer that just everyone downloads by default. Right. Um, anybody that's working on P2P want to give us some thoughts? Preston, do you want to share some of the ideas that we had about beacon P2P? Uh, I, I don't have anything particularly interesting to talk about. Yeah, I think we just uh, I think we just had all the beacon nodes be on like shard negative one or something, um, and and basically you know have yeah have have a network for all the different shards. So okay, so using using the same construction that has topics and just having the beacon chain stuff be on its own topic. Right. Yeah, I think that made sense for us. I think yeah, all beacon nodes are going to be on yeah like shard negative one or some you know some construct like that. Right. Uh, um. Actually, in my uh, in our original um, thoughts, the beacon chain and other main chain messages, uh, which is global to the nodes, can be uh, can be served as a um, global gossip channel for each topic. I mean, for each like for the main chain header, it can be a global. Um, it, it, it can be a topic and subscribed by everyone. So um, in this way, yeah. And um, so that way um, they are, uh, the, 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 the channel, um, they are all in the same network, but segregate by the topics. Right. I guess one question is how many topics per shard do we want? It might make sense to have one for the headers, one for unsigned blocks and um, kind of unaggregated signatures, and then one with, with you know, the, the fully signed and aggregated blocks. Um, so I guess you can dive into whatever level of granularity you want. Uh, just by subscribing to the, the appropriate channels. Um, does uh, the number of channels um, or increase the number of channels impact on um, network amplification rate? Uh, but 
you will only receive, I mean, um, if you want to broadcast a message, uh, you will only broadcast to the peers who subscribe to the topic. So uh, we can design something like, um, if we receive the messages from which uh, we're not subscribing, so we can um, ban the peer, something like that. So you, you will not be affected by other topics. Yeah, but uh, if you're if you're reading uh, another one channel, uh, or uh, it will impact. Uh, as as I suppose, it it's gonna have an impact on uh, discovery mechanism of that uh, network. So yeah, M maybe this impact is really small, and we don't need to care about that. And but. It might be that it's not too small, you know. That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I think that it's worth worth testing and simulating to see um, the impact of this. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think one strategy to mitigate this is to have a common discovery layer for all the channels and then have kind of the, the gossip layer be on top of the discovery layer. Uh, do you mean uh, we already have a sharp preference um, channel? For the discovery, or uh, I mean, yeah, so that that could be one discovery. way to do it, where you have one kind of meta channel where people tell other people about which other channels they're subscribed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we we currently have a a global channel for to do that, but we also. Uh, we are also ex exploring other discovery um, protocols, like um, um, like the rendezvous protocol, um, they, um, proposed by the P2P, but currently it seems not so safe, but I think that we're um, exploring and testing. Okay, so there's a, a Gitter channel uh, that was opened up, I think, this week, um, where people are discussing these things and working on some proof of concept implementations and testing and sim simulations. Um, so it seems kind of like an ongoing discussion. Um, so pop in there if you have some thoughts or if you want to work on that. Um, is there anything P2P related that we want to discuss before discussing the BLS signatures? Uh, as far as we're, I, we're in an hour, um, this probably is going to run on for longer. But if you have to go, you have to go. Um, regarding a lib P2P, if we don't have any, because there is no lib P2P implementation in either C or C++, um, it's not worth it right now to try to implement it from scratch as long as, uh, because there is no go, like uh, we will go in this direction, right? Mm, yes, I think so. I mean, um, uh, we are um, for for our team. We are using Python, so uh, we are um, we will make the the layer in mostly in Go, and we will probably use. Um, we will choose one of the method, like um, Python bindings, or um, entirely use the, using the IPC or RPC to communicate from the um, Python and the Go. So 
I mean, because they only have the Go link and JavaScript. So, I so to answer it, your question, um, uh, what's the question? Are we not? We don't have consensus on it, so it's probably not worth implementing in them yet. Uh, yeah, that was the question. I that seems to be my understanding of it. In that, uh, you know, if you want to start digging into it and working on an implementation, that make that you know that would be a personal decision. But I don't think that we have enough testing to say for sure that that's what we're going to be using at this point. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Got it. Um, you want to move on to the next topic, which is BLS signature standard libraries. Um, there were a bunch of links posted. I know that's kind of one of the big things the teams have been realizing is that there's not necessarily great standard libraries in all these different languages. Yeah. Um, well, for BN128, there's standard libraries in at least some, and like we kind of help standardize them because we forced, uh, like we uh, put it as a pre-compile for uh, Byzantium, right? So the one thing that I think is uh, might end up being tricky is that if we intend to migrate from BN128 to BLS 12.381, then uh, and I'm still not sure yet like what level of difficulty it will involve to switch all of these libraries over. Like if whether it's a five line code change, whether it's something more substantial. What's the benefit of changing the curve? Um, basically, it's got a higher security parameter. Um, like Zcash is changing it. Uh, basically, be, well, for, okay, I guess there's two reasons, right? One of them is that the curve has a higher security margin, so it goes up from something like a 100 and a, and, and a couple of bits to uh, the full 128 bits. And another argument is that in the future, with uh, Zcash and a bunch of other projects switching to BLS 12.381, like this looks like this will be kind of the curve that people are going to standardize around for some time. And so with that in mind, it's worth it to kind of go with the flow, I guess. Yeah, it's also a curve that uh, Chia is intending to use. Yeah. Um, what are the chances of finding another curve? I would say with the effort of standardization that's been going in, like, another curve would have to have really substantial advantages, which would basically mean some kind of discovery of something broken in BLS 12381, which seems like, I mean, it could happen, but it's uh, intuitively seems to be a relatively low probability. Hmm. I guess the one, I guess one property that a new curve could have that would be better, that would make it better than BLS 12.3.d1 without BLS 12.3.d1 being completely broken is if uh, the new curve actually pointed to a pair of curves which um, where one was the uh, modulus of the, uh, of, the, of the other and the other was the curve and the other one was the curve order of the other because that would be really nice for ZK snarks but that's, and I guess it's plausible that people will find that in like five, five years or whatever. Though, even in that case, like, there, there would be no reason for us to switch, and there would be no reason for any application other than CK Starks to switch. Thanks. So, uh, I mean, what further discussion do you all want to have about this? In, in that there's there's a lot of implementations that uh, someone referenced in the, in the uh, GitHub link. Um, is there what what is the process for standardizing these libraries? Is there work that needs to be done? Um, any other thoughts on BLS signatures? Mm. I guess, uh, like for myself personally, to be able to update my uh, Python uh, BN128 library to BLS, I would just realistically need like either like what all the parameters are and what kind of curve, possibly like possibly like a couple of hours of handholding by some cryptographer who's deeply involved in this uh, would uh, 
get it yeah, get it done extremely quickly. Um, then what's, another thing. Mm -hmm. What's the outlook for a fully audited and and let's say low level C API kind of reference implementation mm -hmm. of this curve? So As, the, yeah. the Rust implementation, which is being spearheaded by Zcash, <clears throat> is uh, ha well ha has been uh, audited by a professional company. Um, and also the, the abstract specification of the curve has also been audited by a, a different uh, security company. Um, and the, the, the Rust library is relatively mature in the sense that uh, it's been worked on for, for many years um, and, and, you know, has been audited. Does it have uh, aggregates in it at, the, at this stage? Um, it's it's um, mostly for the um, for the base layer um, curve operations, but the aggregation is is pretty trivial on top of that. Yeah, yeah. Like aggregation of VLS signatures really is trivial. It's just point addition. Yeah, we we kind of hacked together our one just just off your one, Vitalik. But um, it's like it's about as safe as broken glass, in my opinion. I was, I was hoping like maybe a cryptographer could go across it. Yep, totally. Mm, I mean, I did talk to Dan Benet about the algorithms in the Python, and like he said that the hash fun the the hash to G two function I created is fine. Um, he um, we also talked about like issues around rogue key attacks and. I think our preferred technique for dealing with them is this uh, proof of possession at deposit time, which uh, is not currently implemented yet, but it's fairly trivial to implement. Are you thinking of doing that on the, the proof of work chain or separate? Um, I'd say just do it on the beacon chain. Like basically uh, my own philosophy would be to try to do as little on the proof of work chain as possible because that makes it as little work as possible to migrate everything from the proof of work chain to the shard chains when uh, the time to uh, the time for that comes yeah, okay cool and just that, a, like okay. a, a mild note too that i was um when i was going through that that <laughs> reference implementation i got i ended up down a rabbit hole finding that road key attack thing so i don't know it might be worth throwing into that reference implementation just a note about the road key attack and, and how the current implementation is, is vulnerable to that Sure, and I could probably just add a proof of possession method in there. Yeah, and it's um, it's at least referenced in the v two one spec, but it's still um, implied that it would happen on the um, proof of work chain. Um, if we move in that direction, <clears throat> the proof of work chain uh, deposit contract might just become a burn, and everything else, ev everything including the proof of possession, would be validated on uh, the beacon chain. Um, and I think I think it does make sense just because eventually when people are coming in from the shard chains, they're going to have to be uh, like depositing from the shard chains. They're going to have to be doing similar things. So it would make the um, the flow the same. Right. So from a research perspective, I think it's clear that uh, we want to do as much as possible on the beacon chain. One question that remains is how do we do the bootstrapping of the initial validator set? Um, because you need validators to process transactions to onboard new validators. In the beginning, you wouldn't have any validators. Um, but yeah, it's possible I'll, I'll write a research post on that um, soon. And one small note on the Rust. So, in addition to being audited, it, it's, it's very performant. And the, the one kind of known downside of it is that um, it's, uh, it's not um, constant time crypto. So it's possible that it's vulnerable to, to time anything, which could leak private information. Um, so the one thing I think that's important to add is that the computations that are private aren't the, like that, that need privacy protection aren't the pairings. The pairings are just verification. They are the yeah, 
elliptic curve multiplications and knowing how to make elliptic curve multiplications privacy preserving is something that there's been like decades of research on so i don't really see a fundamental obstacle to or, or any reason why it should be more difficult than before right it just hasn't been done yet mm -hmm. Yeah, one general note about Rust would be that the platform support is sometimes lacking for more exotic platforms, but that can be solved in other ways as well. That's mm. why uh, C implementation tends to be the lowest common denominator that we can put on basically any hardware out there and just tweak small parts, whereas with Rust, you might have to, I don't know, update the compiler. Any more comments on DLS signatures currently? Okay. Um, I wrote actual items for clients and research. I don't really think we're necessarily at that point. I think that uh, there's a lot of separate efforts going on and you know what you need to be working on. Um, and in terms of timing for future meetings, um, was is this time reasonable? Thursday is at 2 p.m. UTC every other week. Sorry, Danny. I think you did you skip the current state of cross shard communication research? Sorry, I thought maybe we were gonna. I thought maybe what was said earlier was um, what people wanted to say. But yeah, I, that was more. I guess we were talking more about your stuff at the time. But is there um, do people want to talk about cross shard communication um, research or thoughts or anything at this point? All right, Casey. <laughs> maybe the person who uh, raised the agenda item wants to speak about it. Um, so the current V2 spec doesn't really go through um, cross sharding uh, communication as much. So I was wondering if the research team has done any um, more formalized work on it or if they have any uh -huh. initial ideas. <laughs> yeah, so it's worth noting that the V2 spec doesn't even cover the state transition function at all, right? So it's uh, purely at the data level at this point. I mean, in terms of how to actually run the state, uh, like make the state transitions, I think like there are a lot of the various ETH research posts on like cross or transactions and yanking and so forth. And I think, uh, and I guess some of the uh, research into the synchronous stuff, and that's basically the extent of it at this point. Um, one thing I'd like clarification on from the roadmap architects is if it does make sense. Uh, like I'm hoping to do is to prototype um, a phase two execution engine, you know, in a way where it's decoupled from phase one and we can just black box phase one, ignore all the details of phase one, take as given, you know, some ordered set of shard blocks, some, an ordered set of data blobs with cross links and just prototype phase two. Are they sufficiently decoupled that this um, makes I would say the one, like, if there were really to be decoupled, then one kind of thing that that would force is it would mean that execution and data consensus would actually have to be separate, which would mean that blocks can, would not contain state roots and there would be separate, separate processes for agreeing on state roots and so on, which like we could do if that's what we want, if that's what we wanted to do. So but that's, that is that's, something delayed we have to agree state, on. that's delayed state execution. Yeah, like basically, I think like if we make an agreement that like we're we're doing delayed state execution, then the two are fully decoupled. If like we decide that we're doing state execution at the same time as data consensus, so basically the current the current model, then like the two are coupled. What What do you mean current model? Um, as in like the Ethereum 1.0 model where blocks have uh, state roots. Okay. I mean, one of the things we're considering is um, not shuffling the, the proposers very often 
uh, in the in the shots, and that would be specifically so that they don't have to incur the cost of of sinking the state. Um, but in a stateless execution model, then you don't have that issue either necessarily, except for maybe you know the caching okay. optimizations. Yes, so that's yet another option. Yeah. Yeah, in general, I think the uh, the phase two, you know, uh, the execution engine and the uh, problem of cross shard communication, cross shard transactions, is uh, relatively understudied uh, compared to the de details of of the consensus protocol. So, um, I'm hoping they'll yes spike more interest in uh, in addressing this problem you know uh, orthogonally and, and decoupled from from phase one and also even the even the names phase one and phase two gives the impression that uh, you can't start working on phase two until after phase one is already built so I was hoping to you know clarify that that we can start working on phase two and work on it in parallel while you know other people figure out all the details of phase one. Agreed. <laughs> we need to be thinking about this problem. Um, I'm Excited to see what you have going on. Uh, can you keep us updated in E3 Search or on the sharding channel? Yeah, certainly. It's a little slow going um, for us, the eWASM team, because our top priority is the eWASM testnet. So we're spread a little thin and trying to work on a phase two prototype and uh, launch the eWASM testnet. But uh, we expect to pick up the pace once, um, once the testnet is closer to launch. Cool. Um, is there anything else anyone wants to talk about before we close this first meeting? Just wondered Yeah, I just wanted to, oh, sorry, after you. Sorry, good latency there. Just wondered if there are any thoughts about having a get together, a workshop perhaps around DEF CON um, during or associated with it. Um, if anyone's got any thoughts or plans around that, it'd be good to know. I think there were plans potentially to have a sharding event kind of immediately before uh, or immediately after DEF CON. Um, I think that would make sense um, so that people don't have to travel. Um, everyone's there. Uh, that would be. So from status, we're hosting a hackathon just two days before uh, we could perhaps use that venue. In Prague. In Prague, yeah, the days before. This is something I need to check with the rest of the team, however, whether we'll have room for it. But but it's a possibility that that I can investigate. Okay. Um, I think there's probably general interest. I imagine EF, is, in terms of organizational resources, will be tapped. So someone wants to take the lead on it. Um, status or otherwise, um, just kind of fill everyone in and, and see what the um, consensus is on wanting to do it. I would venture to say, I mean, there might be some sort of breakout session around charting or something during um, DEF CON, but before or after it would probably be more appropriate for a more in-depth session. Cool, that's great. Thanks for the update. Uh, just wanted to plant that seed. I think Paul and maybe Raul had something to say. Yeah, I just wanted to touch briefly on the get shuffling function. I know before it had a little infinite loop thing that it did. I'm just I'm just quickly looking at it now. It kind of looks like it might still do that. Is is that is that the case? The sh which shuffling function are we talking about? Validator shuffling or something? Uh, get shuffling in in Python. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
like it has to have a that like loop that basically is you know so the it is the case that like there's no there's no upper bounds on the number of uh, steps it can take but it's a like it's a pro, it's a probabilistic algorithm and there is a very sharp probabilistic bounds on it like basically the problem is that in order to get an unbiased uh, random number from a uh, from a random number that's uh, larger than the uh, than the first number by something that's not a multiple there's like basically not a way no way to do it without taking on a risk of uh, or without like throwing data away at least some of the time so like that basically uh, I don't think that's going to change but that's also like not something that's dangerous okay sure I'll check it out thanks yeah I remember running into something too Paul I'll we can both check it out thanks to tell cool. And Raul, I keep seeing you unmute. You ready? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to talk about maybe having a shared repo for like testing infrastructure, maybe like uh, storing the contracts that we all have. Um, you know, we could uh, either everyone on the call can be made a contributor to that um, repo, and then you know we could all just keep that as a shared place, um, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page with regards to like VRC stuff, um, and open up issues for possibly like coming up with a shared testing infrastructure, um, kind of like how we currently have an F1.0 for the different teams. Um, yeah, I know there were talks about having shared repos and everything, but it would be cool to just kind of push forward on that more. Um, I agree, especially on the testing front. Do you think that we're ready to begin with some shared testing? No, not yet. Um, <laughs> just, I just wanted to bring that up. <laughs> okay. Um, We'll either get something together in the next couple of weeks or maybe right after the next call. Cool. Okay. Anything else sharding related or anything else anyone has any to say? Cool. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I think that was at least mildly productive. Um, we'll plan on meeting two weeks from today at the same time. I'll probably just start making the meetings, um, scheduling them for an hour and a half. If we break early, that's fine. Um, I think we have generally a lot to talk about and lots to do. Um, keep following E3 Search. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, discussion, uh, pop in these Gitter channels. Um, or reach out to us directly or whoever might be able to answer that. Um, cool. I think that's it. So one thing I forgot to mention is uh, tomorrow with Gitcoin, I will be doing a um, small presentation on VDFs and then there will be time for a kind of sharding AMA if anyone wants to join. I'll be tweeting about, uh, about it um, soon. What platform will that be on? Uh, Gitcoin. Um, I think it will be a Zoom meeting. Um, okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you all next time. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Because we're adding a little something to this one, Sam. As you all know, first prize is Cadillac. There's a lot of people who some second prize. Second prize is Edison. Third prize is your fight.